Now, Paul, the apostle, was given revelation knowledge from the Lord. We know in Scripture he talks about how that he had passed away or that he had moved away from his body. His body was lying without his spirit in it, and he had gone to heaven. And when he went to heaven, he heard conversation between the Father and the Son. And the conversation that he heard, he said, I've never heard anybody else talk like that before. And that conversation that he was privy to listen to was revelation knowledge. Revelation knowledge means knowledge that was revealed unto him. Knowledge that was enlightened unto him. Knowledge that he was given by way of illumination of the Holy Ghost. Have you ever walked at night and needed to have a flashlight? And when you use your flashlight, you kind of, you really depend on it. Why? Boy, I mean, the smallest obstacles can become huge obstacles without illumination, without light. And you learn to depend on the light. I remember as coming up, we used flashlights when we camped out at night because you wouldn't dare want to go on a night walk without a flashlight. Well, you don't want to drive at night without your headlights working. Why? Because your headlights are what gives you the opportunity to navigate through the darkness. Well, this world is filled with darkness. Not a lot of people have the knowledge of God and how he does things. So the Apostle Paul was given revelation, knowledge of what Jesus actually accomplished for all of us who believe on Jesus. Now, if you just read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, you'd be informed as to the history of the walk of the Lord Jesus Christ, his earthly ministry, but you would not be informed as to his heavenly ministry and what he's presently doing, seated at the right hand of God the Father. So the Apostle Paul is informing us believers in Corinthians and all of his epistles about what was actually accomplished for you in the death burial and resurrection of the Lord and his ascension and his present day ministry and his soon coming responsibility in our lives. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, I'll begin reading, knowing that we are being given illumination, revelation knowledge, knowledge that will help us to navigate in this world that's filled with ignorance and darkness, but yet for us, we're walking in the light, and we'll stay away from bumps and bruises and things that uh, are in the roadways of the world. Verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, and I mentioned last week, make sure where it says you, put your name there, because you who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a saint. Now, as a saint, that means that you're going to be an individual that will judge, be a part of the judging of the world. And not only of the world, it will refer to other areas that we'll be judging as well. Verse 2 again, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Now, everybody say, or think along this line, if you're going to be responsible for judging the world, you certainly can handle anything else that you have to deal with that's smaller. And everybody would agree with that. Amen? Amen. So never refer to yourself as an individual without capability of making good judgment. Always say you do have good judgment. Amen? Because you're a saint. And what is a saint? A sanctified one. A righteous one. Now, Psalms 112 talks about the righteous man, and it says that we guide our affairs with discretion. And so that all of us who are in Christ Jesus, we should be willing to say we guide our affairs with discretion. And of course, here he describes unto us that we're able to judge the smallest of matters or we should be able to. Looking at verse 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? 
and we is referring to all of us who believe on the Lord, how much more things that pertain to this life. If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. That means even the person who's considered to be the weakest or the smallest or the least esteemed within the body of Christ still has good judgment. Amen? Now, what do you mean good judgment? They have the capacity to judge with the ability of God because they have been given the mind of Christ. Now, verse, uh, just hold your finger there. I quoted the scripture to you. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter um, 2, chapter 2. Verses 15 and 16, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 15 and 16. You know, Paul the Apostle didn't write in chapters and verses. We, we have those given unto us by the publishers of the Bible for reference sake. He's, he's continuing what he'd been mentioning in the previous chapters and verses. In chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, verses 15 and 16, he says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? Now look at verse 16, the latter part of it. But we, that's referring to you and I, have what? We have the mind of Christ. Isn't that a good thing to hear? Isn't that a good thing to know? That we have the mind of Christ. See, that's revelation knowledge. We are given instruction from the word that we have the mind of Christ. Now, how does an individual actually allow that to come forth? Good judgment from the mind of Christ. Well, you got to agree with it, number one. And number two, you've got to say about yourself what he says about you. If he says you have the mind of Christ, you can't say I'm stupid. You can't say I'm without thought. You can't say, well, that perplexes me to the point where I'm just dumbfounded and I can't ever make judgment on it. No, you've got to speak about yourself the way he speaks of you. He says you have the mind of Christ. Now, knowing that you have the mind of Christ according to the scriptures allows for you to apply your faith. And so we say about ourselves what he says about us. Amen. Well, we, this is really review work, but it's all good. It's worth going over again. Amen. Now, 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, since we have the mind of Christ, we know we have the mind of Christ, and we can therefore judge things that pertain to this life and this world, and we'll judge angels. Now, verse, verse 5 says, of 1 Corinthians 6, I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong, and defraud, and that your brethren. Now here he's saying... Not that we as believers cannot refer to proper order in making judgment with those who are doing wrong within the body of Christ. He's just saying, don't you be a part of the individuals that are doing wrong. Don't you be defrauding. Don't you be lying and cheating and doing things wrong against your family and the Lord. Why? Because it will be detected. It's kind of like police officers that are going around stealing evidence from the evidence room. Well, why would they do something ridiculous like that? Don't they know that the whole office that they work in and everybody wearing badges and uniforms have given themselves over to what? Proper judgment of the law. So that's really bad when an individual decides they want to steal from the evidence locker or they want to go out and do wrong in the name of the law. It just doesn't make any sense, does it? In fact, their badge is not going to help them at all because... There are others who really believe in what the bad stands for, and those others will begin to come against those who do wrong, even if they're wearing a badge. Y'all getting the setting that he's talking about here? So as a Christian, you don't want to get involved in wrongdoing. It's not good to do that. So in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Now therefore, 
there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? So he's not saying that you ought, you're, you ought to be a doormat to be run over. He's just saying, don't you refer to, don't you divert yourself over to becoming a one who is fraudulent. Don't you lie because they lied to you. Don't you be a cheat because people have cheated you. Don't you adopt a new philosophy. Do others before they do unto you. Now that is a philosophy that some people have adopted. You know, you're supposed to do other, unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Y'all getting this? But some people have d developed the philosophy, I'm going to do others before they do me. Okay. Now, verse 8. Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren? Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do, excuse me, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Let me read that to you from the, from the Amplified Version. The Amplified Version, I'll begin reading in verse 8. Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren know ye not, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, I, let me see, I had it on the Amplified. Let me see what happened to it. Anybody have an Amplified version? My Bible's not picking up Amplified now on this particular one. Who has Amplified? I was reading it earlier, so, and it was on my little computer. That's the reason why I bring all these printed Bibles, so I can get it from my... All right, thank you. Can't go wrong with print, can you? Thank you, Jesus. So it is written, so it is. Amen. The Amplified, beginning at verse 8. It says, But instead it is you yourselves who do wrong and defraud, and that even your own brethren by so treating them. Do you not know that the unrighteous and the wrongdoers will not inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God or have any share in the kingdom of God. Now, this is really important. Wrongdoers will not inherit or have any share in the kingdom. He's informing the believers, you that are in the kingdom, you have an inheritance. Don't disqualify yourself from enjoying your inheritance and don't ever think that those outside of the kingdom have any rights to the inheritance within the kingdom. So don't get your judgment Diluted. Don't get your judgment sullied. Verse 9. Uh, latter part of verse 9. Do not be deceived, misled, neither the impure and immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor those who participate in homosexuality, nor cheats, swindlers, and thieves, nor greedy graspers, nor drunkards, nor foul-mouthed revilers and slanders, nor extortioners and robbers will inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God. Isn't that good? Now then, he, I think he breaks it down really clearly so people who wonder, why are you so strict about living a moral lifestyle? Because those who participate in immoral behavior or act outside of the benefits of the kingdom, they won't be able to enjoy the, get the benefits of the kingdom. And then he said in verse 11, and such were some of you once, such were some of you once, but ye were washed, clean, purified by a complete atonement for sin and made free from the guilt of sin. And ye were consecrated, set apart, hallowed, and ye were in, you got this all marked up, praise the Lord, I love it. <laughs> This is good. I love it. Marked up Bible means a good, clean life. <laughs> and you were, well, I can't read it. I wish I could. Let me put it on this. That's okay. Nothing to be apologized, apologetic for. 
And you are justified, pronounced righteous by trusting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit of our God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now look at verse 11. Let's all read verse 11 together. And I'll read it from the uh, King James Version. It's wonderful. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11 says, And such were some of you. Circle the word were. See, you're not anymore. Were is a past tense designation. And this is revelation knowledge given unto us. Illumination. Allow this light to shine on your own self-respect, your self-identity, that you're no longer an idolater. You're no longer a fornicator. You're no longer an abuser with yourself, with mankind. You're no longer persons who are doing wrong or considered unrighteous. You are righteous. Amen. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for who? The for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. Jesus Christ made your body for him to dwell in and inhabit. And he made you to be in the Lord. So here we are now. We're one in Christ Jesus. What I get myself involved in, he's involved in. What I do is what he's doing. And some people don't look at it that way. They think, well, the Lord's in heaven. Hallelujah. He's up there doing his thing. I'm down here on earth doing my thing. And whatever I get into, that's just me and my own business. And Paul is informing you. No, 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 no. See, when you became born again, he moved inside of you. And now that he lives on the inside of you, the very Christ that walked the earth dwells in your mortal body. And because of that, you can access and walk in his ability as you walk by faith and not by sight. And when you really start thinking along those lines, you st anything you face, you're thinking, wait a minute, I'm not facing this by myself. Jesus and I are facing it together. Amen. Amen. And since we're facing it together, then there's nothing that the devil can bring against me that can possibly win over me because Jesus and I, the Father and I, the Holy Ghost in me and I are greater than anything the devil can bring at us in the world. So you have this attitude now, or you should have the attitude when you have the revelation of it, that I can't lose for winning. I can't lose for winning. How can I lose when I'm a winner? And it doesn't matter how bad the circumstances are. It doesn't matter how great the circumstances may appear. I can't lose for winning I'm just, because I'm winning. I always win in Christ Jesus. And I thank my Lord that he lives in me, I and he, and we're one. Now, since my body then belongs to the Lord, how should I live? I should live as one who has the Lord living in me. Verse 14, and God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Let's all read verse 17 together. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Ooh, I love that. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Now, that is referring to the real us. You are not unrighteous. You are righteous. You're right with God. 
You are not dirty. You are clean. You're not a poor little old beggar trying to make it work. No, you have been made rich in Christ. For as he was risen from the dead, so you in Christ Jesus are considered risen in him and seated at the Father's right hand. We're one in the Lord. We're one spirit. Therefore, how should we conduct our lives? Verse 18 says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. I love that. What, he says? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. I want the revelation of that to really be clear and well understood and received. Where is the presence of the Holy Ghost in you? Ah, now I gave the answer. When is the war of 1812 fought? In 1812. So <laughs> is the presence of the Holy Ghost in you? According to verse 19? Yes. Therefore, you have the mind of Christ. Now turn over, keep your finger there, and turn over to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We have an enemy, the, 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 the devil and his cohorts and demonic hosts and so forth. We have an enemy, but the enemy is no match for us. And therefore, you're not to live your life afraid. You're to live your life bold and confident. For God has not given you the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Now notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Wait a minute. Now, we know that the Bible gives us a recorded history of man about 6,000 years. And we know that the devil was cast out of heaven down to earth. Jesus said, I beheld the devil fall from heaven as lightning, right? Came down to earth. And uh, if he was on the earth when Adam was made, which Adam's body was made, let's say, out of the dust of the earth, and we have a recorded history of about 6,000 years. And Adam was given a responsibility to guard the garden from the enemy, which would have been the devil. So how, how, how old is the devil? We really don't know, do we? But, but, but one thing we do have here written to us in Scripture, that the devil, no matter how old he is, he can't get an advantage over us. He cannot get an advantage over us. And that's wonderful revelation to receive. Somebody says, well, wait a minute. I'm only, like for my age, I'm 55 years old, going on 56. Well, you know, Pastor, you're not that old. How, how can you say that you're smart as the devil? Well, I in and of myself can't say that I'm smart as the devil. But I am in Christ Jesus and him who lives on the inside of me. The power of the Holy Ghost inside of me knows exactly how the devil tries to bring strategy against us. And he can never, the devil can never outsmart the greater one within me. He can never outsmart the greater one within you. The power of the Holy Spirit is in you. You have the mind of Christ, the mind of the anointed one. And you know what? The devil can't get an advantage over you. For you who are in Christ Jesus are not what? I'm not ignorant of his devices. You got that? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. That's a good scripture to circle, underline, highlight, let you know, hallelujah, even on your weakest day, you're still stronger than the devil on his strongest day. Why? Because the greater one lives inside of you. There is nothing that you can be confronted with that can ever be greater than you. Hallelujah. That's good teaching, isn't it? That's worth learning, isn't it? Now, that's called revelation knowledge. So Paul the Apostle is letting us know the presence of the Holy Spirit within us is greater than him that's in the world, John said. 
and turn over to another scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Somebody says, well, why are you going over these scriptures in other places? Well, because they all line up. They all go together. They're all saying the same thing, that we who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not by ourselves. We've got God living on the inside of us. And because we have God living on the inside of us, we ought to depend on him. We ought to expect him, the greater one living on the inside of us, to rise up to every occasion that we face. Amen. And when you face a situation that looks bleak or dim, that looks like it's insurmountable, what should you do? Just laugh at it because the devil can't beat you. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. You can laugh at every attack of the enemy that comes against you. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says this. There hath no temptation taken you. The word temptation is a trial or a test you may be facing. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer, that word suffer means allow or permit, you to be tempted, tried or tested, above that ye are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. It's impossible for the devil to get you in a position where you have to be defeated and there's no way out. Hallelujah. There's always a way out. Amen. And the way out is victory in Christ Jesus. Isn't this some good teaching? Now, if you were just looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you would just know what Jesus did in his earthly ministry. You would not be mindful of what has been accomplished for you and who lives on the inside of you and his, and his ability in you now that you are in him and he's in you. Turn over to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. We'll get back to 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter in a moment, but this is some good instruction here. Hallelujah. 1 John chapter 4. Hallelujah. 1 John chapter 4. These letters written to the church by the apostles are informing us of what belongs to us, what we can do in him, what we've been given in him. Hallelujah. And who we are in him. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says, Ye are of God, that means you are of God, you've come from God, you're born of God, little children, and have overcome them. Who? Who's them? The devil and his cohorts. Because greater is he that is in heaven. Is that what it says in heaven? No, he says, greater is he that is in who? that is in you than he that is in the world. Everybody says, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Say it again. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be facing things that look like they're bleak and you can't get past them in them or through them. Oh, oh. <laughs> but you can laugh, hallelujah, because you know something that the devil refuses to admit. And that is greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Turn over and look at the fifth chapter, 1 John chapter 5. Glory to God. Verses 4, we'll look at just verse 4, four verse 1. We keep looking at all these good scriptures here. Verse 1, I'll, I'll stop there. Verse 1, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, down to verse 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat Loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever, some translations read it, 
for whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. See how we're being constantly reminded? You're an overcomer. You're a world overcomer. You have the victory in Christ Jesus. You can't be defeated if you refuse to be defeated. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now we understand why the psalmist David said, Lord, thank you for leading me in the pathways of righteousness for what? For your name's sake. Why? Because as I go is how you're going to be looked at. What happens to me, how I come out, is going to reflect on you. And you know what? I don't believe you want to look bad. Therefore, if I got to go through it, you're going through it with me. And if you're going through it with me, hallelujah, we're coming out on top. Because the Lord doesn't know how to lose, never would be taught how to lose, and refuses to accept defeat. Amen? Amen. Praise be unto God. And we're in that same family. We have the same spirit of faith. Thank you, Jesus. And I just tell you, I just, I refuse to lose. How about you? You ref say, I refuse to lose. <laughs> I've got the greater one in me. I have knowledge of the wicked one's devices. I have the mind of Christ. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm one spirit in the Lord. God is in me. My Father is in me. Jesus is in me. The Holy Spirit is in me. I can't lose. I cannot lose. Hallelujah in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Turn back over to 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter again. If I start floating up, you know what to do. Just grab my feet. Come on up with me. Hallelujah. Or pull me back down. Hallelujah. This is such exciting information. This is such well worth information. This is revelation knowledge. And this is not really something the enemy wants taught to the people of God. Why? Because when you start finding out about your rights and privileges and what you can do and how you can't lose because of who you are in Christ Jesus and what you have, well, blessed be God, the devil's got to go find somebody else who he may devour because he won't be able to devour you because you have too much knowledge of who you are. Isn't that good knowledge? Praise be unto God. 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter now, again, verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Notice that verse 20. For ye are bought, say, for I am bought with a price. I therefore glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which belong to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, instead of me acting like a doormat, instead of me acting like I'm a victim of circumstances, I see myself as a caretaker for this body. For this body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. This body is that which the Lord said he inhabits and dwells in and takes up residence in. And because of that, I'm just not going to let anything happen to this body. I'm not going to allow this body to be abused and misused. I'm not going to let anybody graffiti this body. I'm not going to let anybody mar this body. Why? Because this body don't really belong to me. It belongs to God. This body's been paid for. I've been bought with a price, and therefore I'm to do what with my body? Glorify God with it. Glorify God with it. That means I have to ask him, what is it that he will permit? What will he allow to be done in this body? 
Now, we've covered this scripture before in Hebrews, the eighth chapter in previous weeks. But go on over to Hebrews, the eighth chapter. Let's look at this. Some people say, well, I can just tat up my body any way I want to. I'll just pierce it all over and do all this and that. I'm thinking, well, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, then did you know you've got to consult the Lord about that? Your body don't belong to you. It belongs to him. And he'll give you permission to tat it up, then be it. go ahead and tat it up all you want to. But if he, when I say tat, you know what I'm talking about, tattoo it. Now, some people say, well, are you trying to put me under condemnation? I got tattoos. No, that what you've done in your days of ignorance, you did. But now you know more. Walk according to what you now know, amen? <laughs> Hallelujah, amen? I'm not getting a big one. Give me a big amen on that. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> One individual said, oh, and I was talking to him. He's out of town. He was talking to me on the tel telephone. We were going over some scripture. And he says to me, he says, Pastor Dick, but that scripture we just read, he said, that scripture is so good. Hallelujah. Woo, that scripture is so good. It just touched my heart. He said, I'm going to go and have it tattooed on my body. I said, brother, now wait a minute. Hold on a minute. I'm glad to hear that you're excited and thrilled about the scripture that you just read. And I said, isn't it wonderful that the word of God is meat for our spirit? We're feeding our faith on the word of God. And I said, you know, the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation is something we ought to be feeding on. I said, now, only thing is, is if you only take favorite scriptures, certain scriptures that you're now happy about, you go and have yourself tat your body tattooed. I said, when we read more scriptures, you'll be looking to tattoo. I said, pretty soon you'll be running out of room. You'll be running out of room. I said, instead of tattooing it on your body, why don't you do this? Put it on your heart. Write it in your heart. Keep it in your heart, the tables of your heart. And allow your soul to receive it. That means your mind. Allow it to be etched in your soul. Receive with meekness the engrafted word, the Bible says in James, which is able to what? To save your soul. Let it be etched in your thinking. Don't ever let it go. Instead of writing it on your body. Why? Because eventually those tattoos begin to fade they get out of shape, get distorted. After a while, they just look like a big old blob. They're not legible, you know, and nobody really knows what you're trying to say or proud, being proud of anyway. I know, I know this hits hard with some people, especially Christians, because they figure, well, you ought to just leave me alone in my business. Well, your body is his business. That's what I'm letting you know. All right, Hebrews chapter 8. Since I'm meddling, let me just go all the way in. Hebrews, the eighth chapter, verse 10 says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to be a people and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for all shall know me from the least to the greatest for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more in that he set the new covenant he hath made the first old now that which decayeth now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away so notice that he's informing us have this word in your heart and in your what and in your mind. Now, I quoted this, which I said in James. Let's turn over and let's look at that. James, turn over to James, a few pages to your right. James chapter 1, James chapter 1, verse 21, James 1, verse 21. See, as believers in Christ Jesus, we come to an awareness through Scripture that our bodies don't belong just to us. It belongs to God, and we're caretakers of our body. James chapter 1, verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to what? Which is able to save your soul. 
receive with meekness the engrafted. When you hear about the word engrafted, have you ever, I mean, we're coming up on the holidays. People like to get gifts to one another. They've got a shop out there called Things Remembered. Now, they're not paying me any royalties to mention this. I'm just letting you know. But one of the things that they have, like, little novelty items, card holders, pens and pencils, cufflinks and things like that, you can take their product that they sell you and have it engraved is what I'm getting at and personalize it. The thing that you buy, if you're going to give it to somebody, it doesn't have to be just generic. It doesn't have to be just for anybody. No, you can make it real personal. I'm telling you, take these scriptures and make it real personal. Put your name where it says, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Say my soul. Put your name in there where, and where it says your soul. Put your name. I would put my name Gary right there in my own Bible. I'm receiving with meekness a teachable heart. The word of God, which is able to be engraved in my soul. My mind literally can have the word engraved on it. All right, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians again, and we'll look at chapter, chapter 1, of, excuse me, chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, looking at verse 1. Isn't it good... To hear that the word can be engraved in our thinking. That this word can be so strong in our thinking that even when it looks like we're sleepy or groggy and we have to respond to something, we'll respond with a vigilant attitude because even when you sleep or groggy, you still have the word coming out of your soul because it's in your mind and it's in your heart. Now, some people wonder, well, how can Jesus be made a curse without curse when he was hanging up on the cross, but yet he's still quoting scripture? You understand now how he was still quoting scripture. He was quoting from the Psalms when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why was he quoting that from the scripture when he was made sin with our sin? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That means he has the knowledge that he was forsaken. He knows that it was his God that has forsaken him. And he's asking the question, why have you done it? Well, because he, now that he's made sin with our sin, he's sin. He's literally, he is what? He's sin with our sin. He's in darkness. But yet even in his darkened state, even when he's took, taken upon himself our sin, our unrighteousness, when he took upon himself our sicknesses and our diseases, our shame and our pains and all of that, he's still quoting scripture. Why? Open book question. Class, why is he still quoting scripture? Because it's etched in his, in his soul. He's up on the cross as the serpent that was on the pole in Moses' day. The very picture of sin, the epitome of evil itself, all upon the uplifted cross. But yet he's still quoting scripture because he has that word in his heart and in his mind. Y'all got it? Be so infused with the word be so soaked in the word that it, it's like a sponge you take a sponge and put it in water but when you pick it up out of the water if you put just a little pressure on it what's going to come out what it's got in it water squeeze the sponge what's coming out water's coming out of it if you're soaked in the word when pressure is put on you what's going to come out oozing out the word of God are y'all getting this Hallelujah. Backed in the corner, facing situations and circumstances. May look like, oh, boy, I got you, and you can't do anything about it. What comes out of you? The word just comes pouring out of you. Why? That's all that's in me. That's all that's in me is the word. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all want to see a little bit more of that? We're there. We might as well just hang out here for a while. Turn over to the Psalms and see what David had to say concerning that very thing. David knew that when you're trained properly in the word, that even when it comes to time of battle, if you keep yourself immersed in the word, then your mouth will speak the word 
Psalms 39. Turn over to Psalms 39. You'll speak the word even when it looks like you're dealing with circumstances and situations where there's no way out. But you still speak the word. Oh, glory to God. We have the same spirit of faith as we believe, therefore we speak. Psalms 39, verse 1. David said, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. See that? Let's all read that out loud together. I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Why, David, would you keep your mouth with a bridle? Because the enemy is looking for conversation he can work with. And you're not going to give him any conversation to work with. Amen? Amen. Keep speaking the word. Keep speaking the word. Keep speaking the word. That's why you get, that's why what we're doing now. We're getting immersed. We're immersed in the word. And the word is washing and cleansing and renewing our mind. So that when we face situations, we keep speaking the word. And the word will penetrate. It will move the mountain. And it will deal with the circumstances that we have faced. Hallelujah. And the joy of the Lord continues to be our strength. You're there in Psalm still? Look at Psalms 50, verse 23. <coughs> Psalms 20, excuse me, not, Psalms 50, verse 23. Psalms 50, verse 23. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. Let's all read that out loud together. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. Now that part where he says, to him who orders his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. God says, I can move on your behalf if you'll just have good conversation. If you speak right, I'll move on your behalf. If your words allow me to work on your behalf, I will confirm my word with signs following. So, whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. So, if you don't know a verse of scripture, what should you do? Just worship and praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful word, his wonderful works to, the, to, the, to men. Give the Lord praise and thanksgiving for what he's done on your behalf already in Christ Jesus. If you can't think of anything but just the fact that you're saved, blessed be God. Lord, you said you would save me and you saved me and I am saved. You said you would deliver. I am delivered. I am delivered and I thank you for it. Hallelujah. You keep singing like that and thinking like that. You look up and look around you and the enemy's all defeated. You say, well, how did I get out that situation I was facing? You gave God permission to move on your behalf because you ordered your conversation correctly. And this is exactly what Abraham did in Romans, the fourth chapter. Abraham did what? He gave God praise and thanksgiving and he grew in faith. He grew stronger in faith and he became fully persuaded that what God had promised, God was able to perform. And as long as he gave God praise and thanksgiving, he didn't have time to be weak in his faith. He didn't have time to look at the circumstances. All he did was look at what God told him. God told him, I am your deliverer. Order your conversation aright, and I will move on your behalf. And that's all Abraham did. I just, I just praise you and thank you. Thirteen years, he believed for his wife to get the revelation that she would have a child. Thirteen years. Some people have, have dealt with circumstances for two minutes and are ready to throw down the towel and talk crazy. Don't give up on your confession. Turn over to Hebrews. Chapter 10. 
Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, verse 23. Revelation, knowledge. God can move in your life, but he has to have your permission. You've got to speak his word no matter what it looks like, no matter what it sounds like. Keep speaking the word and let the word, let the word work in your life. Let the word work in your life. Now, when you speak God's word, Hebrews, the 10th chapter is what we're looking at now. When you speak God's word coming out of your heart and out of your tongue, that's called rhema, R-H-E-M-A, the rhema. Let the, the two-edged sword of God's word work on the circumstance. Hallelujah. Let the sword of the word, the sword of the spirit work on the circumstance you may face. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Now, what is a profession? A confession. What is a professional? A person says, I'm a professional. What does that mean? An expert, right? It's a person who has confidence that they can get the job done. So be a professional Christian. Say, I am a professional Christian. I have confidence in God's word. The word to get the job done. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. He is faithful that promise. Why do I keep talking in the manner in which I'm bragging on God? Because he's faithful. He's a faithful God. Hallelujah. You sure sound like you're going to get out of the situation. You sure look like you've got the victory already. Oh, yes. Why? Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Aren't you going to feel bad? If God was really for you, wouldn't you be in a position where you were different? You wouldn't have to face this? No, no. God takes pleasure. God takes pleasure. When I face difficult situations and in the natural, it looks like I'm weak. But when I'm weak, then am I strong? What do you mean, then am I strong? Well, him who's in me, the I am, then I am strong. There's no way I can lose. I can't go under for going over. It can't get too bleak where the light can't be seen or shine. His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. I sing glory and honor and praises unto God. Why? Because I hold fast the confession of my faith without wavering. For he is faithful that what? That promise. You still there in Hebrews, the 10th chapter? Look at verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, <laughs> which has great recompense of reward. Oh, hallelujah. God says, don't you throw down your confidence. Now, notice he didn't say, he didn't say that, you know, I'm sorry, you all that have to face difficult circumstances that the devil's going to take away your confidence. No, no. He says, don't you throw your confidence down. Don't you throw away your confidence. Have confidence. Has any of you ever encountered a little chihuahua? I mean, they don't, they're not even two pounds big. Some of them, you know, they have different breeds of them. But they're, uh, I remember just as a little kid, I saw this little dog and I thought, this little old dog, he can't do anything. And I came over to pet him. He went to barking and chasing me and tried to snip, snip, bite me. And I'm thinking, here I am running from this little old bitty dog. This dog is hardly very big at all. But they even go after big dogs. You know why? They're confident. And their confidence is what? It is respected and rewarded. And oh, yes. The, even big dogs don't mess with this little character. Why? There's just too much fight in him. He really thinks he ought to win. He thinks I, I can handle anything and everything. 
Now, he tells us in the scriptures, the word of God tells us in the scriptures, don't you cast away your confidence. Why? Because your confidence will be greatly rewarded. Your confidence will be rewarded. Some people say, well, I'm quoting scripture, but I don't have any confidence in it. Oh, no, no. He said, your confidence will be rewarded. Well, how do I get to be confident? Keep on saying the word. Talk yourself into being confident. Talk yourself into being confident. Hallelujah. David encouraged himself in the Lord. He said, verse 36 of Hebrews 10, for you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So why would you then be patient? Because the promise is forthcoming. You can't lose with the stuff you use. Hallelujah. I'm a poet, and I didn't even know it. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Somebody says, oh, I mean, that scripture, you're just quoting it. But you know what? My confidence will be rewarded, and the scripture that I'm quoting, the promise of God, will be fulfilled in my life. I'm not letting go of my confidence. I'm not letting go of my confession. Oh, I remember the day. My wife and I were having our firstborn daughter. We were in this hospital called Queen of Angels. And at that time, the delivery rooms were down in the basement in the bottom floors of the structure there, tall building and so forth. And the doctors were crying. The doctor was crying out with the service nurses and so forth that were working on my wife. And he said, I can't stop the blood flowing. I can't stop it. My daughter was born. She had come forth. They had just gotten the afterbirth out. And they were, at that time, they used the medicine along with the pushing on the uterus to get the uterus to contract. And the uterus was not contracting. Every time they pushed on her, blood was just flowing out of her. And he said, I'm losing her. I'm losing her. And I can't stop it. And he had the nurses, well, and the doctor was so perplexed by it, he's grabbing his head and he's running around, walking around her. I'm losing her. Oh, I don't know what to do. I'm losing her. I can't stop the blood from flowing. Then he would go through and push on her. Then he had the nurses pushing on her uterus and area there. And every time they push, I'm standing there. I took the classes so I could stand by her bedside when she was in the delivery there. And I'm seeing blood just flowing out of her. And it looks like she's going to die. And when the doctor is all perplexed, that surely is a sign to be what? Aware that it's serious. And I left him and the nurses, and I ran into the place where we were waiting, the, the, the pre-delivery room. I ran in there and threw myself across the bed that she was on when we were waiting, having the contractions and so forth. Now she's in there in the operating room, but I threw myself across the bed, and I said, in Jesus' name, according to Ezekiel 16, 6, she'll live and not die. She'll live and not die. I just screamed it out, lying there on the bed, and I said, in Jesus' name, the devil's not taking my wife. I knew I was in a battle for her life. I knew that the doctors were the doctor was perplexed, and I knew the service, the, the the nurses that were working with him, the operational team that was with him, they were they were just they just they were chalking her up as a woman who was going to die in birth. She had a condition what they call placenta acrea. It's when the 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 afterbirth adheres to the uterine wall, so that when the afterbirth comes loose, it doesn't just come loose, it actually rips the uterine wall, and that uterine wall there is just an open wound, just gushing out blood. She was on her way out. And I quoted Ezekiel 16, 6 out loud. And in my quoting of Ezekiel 16, 6, I went back into that room, and the nurse said, doctor, something's happening. It's stopping, it's stopping, it's stopping. He said, what? What did you say? They said, it's stopping, it's stopping. He said, all right, get the blood transfusion going, get it going, put some blood in there and so forth. He said, it's stopping? How'd you do it? They said, we don't know, it's just stopping. I know what happened. Ezekiel 16, 6. Turn over and look at that. <laughs> Ezekiel 16, 6. See, this is the reason why I get myself in the Word. You never know when you're going to have to use it. 
be instant in season and out of season. I thought we were just going to rejoice and have our firstborn child. I didn't know I was going to have to fight for the life of my wife. I didn't know the devil was going to try to take her life. I didn't know that her blood would be flushing out of her body to the point where she could have died. That was a strategy of the enemy. But thanks be unto God which giveth me the victory through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not ignorant of the devil's devices. Amen? Amen. Why? Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Ezekiel 16, 6 says, And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live! Yea, I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live! And that's exactly what she did. She lived. How appropriate is that scripture? And she's with me today, 33 years later. Still have our child. She's alive and well. Your family's doing fine, and my wife is doing fine. Why? Holding fast the confession of our faith, allowing the word to be engrafted in my thinking and my heart, and I have to quit because I've run out of time. Oh, my goodness. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Salvation is the free gift that the Lord offers anyone who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10 that with our hearts we believe unto righteousness and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. I trust that you will believe God's word, that your faith will be in the risen Savior who came to give his life for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Will you pray with me this prayer of salvation? It's not difficult. It's very easy. But you must mean it from your heart. So repeat these words after me. Jesus, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. With my mouth, I confess you and I receive you. As my Savior. Jesus, thank you for making my heart your home. Thank you for living in me. God the Father is now my Father, and the Holy Spirit has done a work in me. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, and thank you for guiding my life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're here to be a blessing to you at Spirit Food Christian Center. The way this broadcast is brought to you is by people's faithful sowing and reaping as a result of God's word being given unto them. So I want to encourage you, be a part of this ministry of sowing and reaping. The Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In this ministry, we believe that man must hear the word of God. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Bible declares... God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God loves a cheerful and hilarious giver. I encourage you, be a part of this ministry. Be hilarious in your giving and watch the Lord bring it back to you in many, many ways. In Jesus' name. You have been watching the Spirit Food Christian Center worldwide webcast online at www myspiritfood.com Join us for worship service each Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And be sure to check out our website for our weekly live broadcast and much, much more. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good.